just want to do the brief introduction of our guest speaker here today. Maybe I should start by myself. I'm uh, David Mugise. I'm the acting executive dean of this faculty, faculty of natural and agricultural sciences. But we have our guest here today, Dr. Hazel Tumelo Mufandu. Um, in brief, she has a BSc honors and an MSc, and she also has a PhD in biology and molecular biology. Um, she's currently a senior lecturer and a subject group leader, and she sits at Mafike campus. Um, this lecture is actually the second part because it was delivered already at Mafike, and uh, from here she's on a road show. She's actually also going to end up in Val campus. And uh, this is happening at a very you know, opportune time because uh, the first lecture when she gave it at Mafi King, we had only, I think, about three infections of this coronavirus in South Africa. But as we were speaking today, last night, we were counting 13. So really, um, it, it is coming at a real opportune time. And uh, Dr. Mofundu has published profusely uh, on HIV detection and development. She is therefore a very, very promising scholar with a great potential, and we are extremely proud of her. Um, we are very all ears and very eager to hear what she has to say to us. Uh, I also forget to mention that she's published or co-published uh, articles with very, very prominent scholars in South Africa, including the late Professor Bongani Majosi of uh, the University of Cape Town. And she's also worked with uh, other collaborators, including Professor uh, Ellen Gray of Australia, as well uh, as Lynn Morris. Lynn Morris is an A-rated scholar. So here we have somebody who uh, knows that the story that she has to tell us. In, in, in short, colleagues, let me just hand over to her, and uh, I hope you'll all enjoy this uh, evening. Thank you. Should. Hello? Hello? Thank you, for, thank you so much for that humbling uh, introduction. I didn't even expect him to go that far in introducing me, with, you know, of mentioning my mentors. All those are my mentors. I'm still crawling behind them as I come along this career path. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Apologies once more. Uh, it's the stop and goes on the road, it's uh, traveling. I think we need to look into the budget of flying <laughs> amongst these campuses. Uh, yes, I promise to give an update, as uh, Prof. Medis has just uh, explained that I did this a couple of two, three weeks back in uh, Mafikeng, and uh, he was of the opinion that no, this is a heated debate, you need to come, let all campuses hear about this. So hence, uh, I'm here today. So from what I've said, it's an update because it's forever evolving daily. We get new uh, stats and so forth. So the outline of my talk will be just the background of what are coronaviruses, previous coronavirus outbreaks that have happened uh, in the past, origin of human coronaviruses, where are they coming from, common signs of the infections that we need to know or already know by now. Current coronavirus, the new one that we are facing currently, how was it named, how did it come to be? Uh, findings of the largest study in China that's uh, done thus far, and um, global consequences of this outbreak. I'm sure we know, but we'll just touch a bit on those. The global spread also, what are the stats looking like? Why is this unstoppable? That's the major, re I guess, the main reason why we are all here today and the myths and facts that we need to look out for, and lastly, if there are any treatments and vaccines available for this uh, virus. So as you might have all heard by now, I'm, I, I, I like the media the way it goes, because it's teaching us as we're checking every day that this virus was named Corona because it's from this Latin word, Corona, meaning crown, because it has all these protruding crowns on the surface as you look under the electron microscope, hence the naming of these coronaviruses. 
It's a family of large, uh, it's a large family of corona, uh, of, of viruses. They cause illnesses ranging from your common colds, flu, and uh, to more severe respiratory infections, not only in humans, but also in animals. They are single-stranded, positive strand RNA viruses. And uh, if we had our biological science students here, they know how this Baltimore classification goes. Uh, this is where we now group our RNA viruses. We have double-stranded and single-stranded. And even under the single-stranded, we have those that are, have a positive configuration and those with a negative. So the coronaviruses are in the positive configuration of the RNA viruses. And if you look at that, I've got this up because we expect it to be similar to influenza. But look at influenza. It's actually a minus configuration of an RNA virus. It's not even clustering together with the flu virus. Even the real viruses that are common, causing the common colds are not even classified under the positive single-stranded viruses. So that's just showing you how viruses can actually evolve and you know, mutate and become something new altogether. They contribute to about 15% of the common colds. Like I said, we have different kinds of viruses that cause these common colds. Real viruses, I mean, right, uh, sorry, those that cause the common, you know, runny nose. We have those, the influenzas, and then we have uh, the rest. So from the 100% of the viruses that are causing these common colds, coronaviruses co contribute 15% of those. They can also cause severe diseases fatal infection and we've seen that happening in China and uh, one of the uh, previous ones that have been shown is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Like I said we look at the what happened previously and where we are going now with the current one. So this one was one of the first previously and then another one was referred to as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Just to give you a bit of background. This Middle East MERS happened in 2012. This is like eight years ago. And uh, this, this is like the figure of uh, cases that were actually found to come about from the MERS. And then you can see the death rate, 858 of those. And unfortunately, it affected 27 different countries. And this is, you can see it's a report from this year, 2014. Now, obviously, when the new corona came out, you know, scientists had to go back and check what did we have before, how is it now, and then these are the figures that they just gave an update on this MERS. And the SARS virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome, it, this one, the epidemic, the outbreak happened in 2003, 17 years ago, that's a long time. It affected, it cost, had uh, resulted in about 8,000 uh, cases. Also, it was intercontinental, and the infection range rate range was from 13 percent in those under the age of 60 to about 45 in the in the elderly above 60. And then, uh, what I'm sure you've heard by now is that uh, these uh, viruses are zoonotic, meaning that they come from animals. Investigations actually revealed back in the days when SARS coronavirus was coming out, that it was actually coming from what we call civet cats to humans. So this is because our fellow Chinese like the, the delicacies, they call them exotic animals. They just enjoy them. So they actually enjoy over dinner this kind of cats, and that's how it was actually then transferred, the virus from such cats to humans. The civet cats, was even banned during that time in Hong Kong, and people still crossed over, you know, the borders to go into China and get these cats because they just missed the taste. That's how much they liked it. In southern China, it's widely believed that eating wildlife increases, you know, your vigor of uh, human organs. So hence, they, they just believe it, it, it will never kill them. And this is a kind of situation. This is how they actually get the market. It's not even a proper market. It's some place in the street, you know, like our local taxi rank areas where, you know, this is live frogs. You want to actually buy them alive. 
you know, this is the guy selling, cutting, whatever <laughs> selling. So obviously this kind of a setup calls for infection, whether they like it or not. And this was uh, evidence now that the SARS was actually coming uh, from this civet cat after investigations, after the uh, outbreak occurred. And the MERS virus, it, it was believed to be coming from the dromedary camels to humans. And at that time, we were not sure, they were not sure whether was it humans giving it to uh, camels or the other way, because now, you know, they tend to be like pets to their owners. They can even kiss them and so forth. And this has now ended in those days. Um, the horses had to even get masks like those. And ultimately, it was actually two years later confirmed that it was indeed coming from camels. So this is just, you know, uh, the history of these coronaviruses, where they can indeed showing that they can actually come from human uh, uh, animals. And several known coronaviruses are actually circulating in animals that have not yet infected in, uh, humans. It's not a call for concern, just to let you know that there are these coronaviruses are there in the animals. It's just a matter of as humans, you know, not eating those kinds of animals, then we won't be in the situation we are facing now. The common signs of infection, I'm sure you've heard about it already now. Respiratory symptoms, your coughs, shortness of breath is the very first one I would, I would say people should look out for. High fever, the minute the body starts feeling like it's flu with very high fever above 38. Body aches, you know, those that have had flu before, they'll tell you your joints feel like, you know, they've cracked you up, you can't even you know, do anything with your joints, you just, you are exhausted, tiredness, those kinds of uh, symptoms are the ones we should actually look out for. Unfortunately, it looks like flu, so it's not easy to really differentiate at the moment. Hence, you know, people are now in a panic because it's, it won't be easy for, for people to know when it's corona and when it's uh, a flu. In severe cases, the infection causes pneumonia, severe acute respiratory symptoms, kidney failure, and then we know by now that it can even lead to death. Standard recommendations, we've heard about this, regular hand washing, and I'm happy to see our university actually getting on board. I've seen today our toilets were busy, mafiking, placards everywhere, wash, and even soaps. You know, it was a good sign to see that we are taking, we are really taking this seriously. Covering of our mouths and nose when coughing and sneezing, Heard about it and also cooking our meats because now we're still trying to find out where this is coming from. Let's rather be safe. Half done your raw, what you call it, half done teaspoon steaks. Please just enjoy it well done for now and then we'll go back after the outbreak is over. Your parboiled eggs, please. Let's just be cautious there. And uh, also avoiding close contact with anyone showing symptoms. So the minute somebody has flu like symptoms, Rather be safe than sorry, basically. And uh, back to this novel coronavirus, this new one now that is causing havoc globally. It's a new strain altogether. It's, we call it new because it's now out of the animals into cats. I mean, from the animals into humans, it's new in humans. And uh, once it, it hit the ground in December, uh, in China, experts had to meet and actually get to know, you know, with everything we need to give it a name. Everything on this planet has a name. They had to now look, go under the microscope, get down and busy, and they, as you can see, the taxonomy of viruses and the WHO came up with the naming of this, and then hence it was referred to as COVID-19. The illness, basically, the illness. This is now the sickness coming from the virus. It's referred to as COVID-19. COVID, simply for coronavirus. 19 for the year it was identified, because it was identified in December. Uh, reported, the first report was in Wuhan City in uh, Hubei province in China, 31st of December, right on the brink of a new, a new year. And then uh, the virus now was named SARS, coronavirus type 2 because they actually determined that it was the same species of the first SARS that I talked about that happened 
back in 2003, but it's a different strain of that SARS virus. Hence now the name of the virus is officially known as the SARS coronavirus type two, meaning that the previous one will be now referred to as type one. And the, the CDC in China, sorry, found that uh, they actually undertook a large study and from that, they found that uh, about more than 80% of cases were mild, which is good. It's good to know that at least not everybody is dying. And then unfortunately, with the elderly being the heart stick, uh, struck now, or those that are more than 80 years of age are now more at risk. This is the study that was undertook, that large study. It involved a total of 72,000 patient records, as you can see. 44,000 of those were confirmed cases making 62% and 16,000 uh, of those were suspected cases at the time of the study. Just a brief summary of the results of the study. Among those 44, 61.8 were confirmed cases, as I've said, 86.6 .6 were 30 to 79 years old, and uh, with 74.7% diagnosed uh, in Hubei and 80.9% were those that were considered mild. A total of 1,023 deaths occurred among the confirmed cases with a fatality rate of 2.3%. The spread in Hubei started in January, went further from December, increased in January, and by 11 Feb, it was starting to show a decline. But unfortunately, by then, 1,386 countries were affected. This is now affecting 31 provinces. It was fast. The onset of the symptoms peaked around the 23rd to the 26th of January and began declining, like I said, leading up to the 11th of uh, This is now in China. No? But now, remember, it's gone out of China now. So the states are show showing the same now in other uh, countries. A total of 3,019 health workers, unfortunately, have been infected in China from this study, 1,700 of which were confirmed cases, and unfortunately five of our dear colleagues passed on to the virus. The study also identified a sex ratio uh, with men more likely to be getting this, dying from this, than females do not need to panic. It's still a first study. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, when I get to this slide, people start panicking, Don't, no stress. And uh, it has also shown, confirmed that existing illnesses that put patients at risk are the ones that we all know, your heart disease, sugar diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, you know, all the, when you, your flu and your stuff that are affecting the pulmonary respiratory diseases and uh, high blood pressure. So those that are suffering from these are the ones that actually succumbing to the infection. The study also found a zero fatality rate for small children. And as you can remember in the previous slide, I said the age was from 30 to 79. It's still a mystery. It's a mystery. And now I've got this today, that corona is mysteriously sparing kids. So now it's a sign that scientists should then start looking as to what, what are the differences, what, it should be, what could be happening in others that is not happening. And as you can see here, 2.4% in China, with the big outbreak in China, only 2.5%, 4% were reported cases from children, and with only 0.2% of these children got critically ill. But none of those actually succumbed to death. So it's still that mystery, it's a WHO report. So hopefully this, you know, this kinds of stats shows, uh, give us some hope. And uh, this is just where, you know, the reality of this, how China oh, first looked, because now there's no more crowding like this, we are all indoors, unfortunately. All have to be quarantined, self-quarantine. We go around the screening everywhere just to highlight this to the audience, this is not a true uh, reflection of the corona, because I know we get all sorts of pictures and all sorts of stories around this. This, if you look closely, this person is profusely bleeding on the floor. You know, if you see here, 
This is the cause of hemorrhagic fevers, your Ebola's, not coronavirus. So there's also, hence I, I have a slide where I'll be talking about effects. Uh, yeah, again, this is how it looks at our airports, arrivals, port of entries. We have to be going through all this. And it's just interesting to see how the different kinds of masks we get now with this coronavirus. It's not new, not, we, not designed ones for kids and uh, specially made ones, but just to show that we really need to be alive. The situation in the airport is, it's, is critical. This is what needs to happen after people get off the planes. This is a case when Germany first got their uh, cases from China to were actually on the, on the flight after being confirmed. This is what now the German airport had to be decontaminated all around. And I hope this was done in KwaZulu-Natal when our case <laughs> happened. And uh, I'm sure you've heard about this. Your cruise ships, imagine carrying 3,700 with only two or three infected on this ship. What havoc that will cause. Another one, this had to be, you know, it was blocked entry wherever it wanted to go, as you can see from the headline. It was uh, it turned away by Japan, Taiwan, you know, you name them, because they just didn't want to have anyone coming with a flu. But uh, ultimately, I think it managed to go through Cambodia. So these are the kinds of uh, situations that we're facing. And... Uh, you know, this is when now we need to really start facing reality and thinking of uh, reduced travel. And I'm sure some of you have noticed all our conferences that have international conferences have to be cancelled. Juventus games, you know, all these big things happening in the world where there's masses of people coming in another place have to be postponed. And this was one study that actually assessed the impact of reduced travel on expectation dynamics of this virus. And they actually go to show, uh, the study looked, uh, suggests that from 28 Jan to 7 Feb, 226 exported cases were actually prevented due to travel restrictions. So we just have to, you know, get to that level of not traveling until this comes, this outbreak comes down. And we know the effects on the market those with iPhones, if you were planning to upgrade any time, beginning of 2020, probably you need to wait a bit. There might not be a new iPhone coming anytime soon because of this. It's affecting a whole lot of things. Food industry in China, it's bad. And if you think, if food is affected, what about the clothing industry? Who cares about what they are wearing now if they can't even access, go out to the market and buy themselves food? So that's how hectic it is. Those of us that are into investments, shares, this is how it looks. I just got an example of the European stocks. If you look at this, from Thursday 20, to it's like a week period. Look at the drop in stocks. That's how dramatic and chaotic this virus is. And look at the t a yield, 10-year yield uh, graph showing us just from January 02 to 26, two months. So those that are investing offshore stocks and uh, we, we, you know colleagues, we are hard hit. And I guess now it tells you where to move your stocks now. So if you know you have shares in this, it's now dipping down. This is where you should be investing in a way. I guess this is like on a lighter note, you know. <laughs> now you can then have a, you know something hopeful, something to look forward to. Move your shares to those companies that are making masks, obviously, because now they're making loads of money. Hand sanitizers are running out, this scam, it's, it's, it's hectic. Thermometers even, because now people are worried about the temperature. Now they need to check. If I'm really having a high fever, I must be careful. So that's the situation. This is like hardly two weeks ago, when uh, WHO was saying, calm down, it's not a pandemic yet. Unfortunately, only two weeks later, it is actually a pandemic. It has broke out of China. It's across continents. It's reached even us in Africa, where we least expected it. 
This is the current figures as of yesterday, 10 March. As you can see, we are there on the map. I'm sure you've heard about our cases. Morocco, Algeria is busy increasing. We are sitting at 12, I think, right now. South Africa, unfortunately, we are part of it because we have open borders. You know, we are too friendly. And uh, as you can see, China is still, it's, it's just wreaking havoc all over globally. And this is as of today, we have 13 cases in South Africa. You can see Western Cape is one, five in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal where it landed, it's now at seven. And these are the figures. The, we know that the very case, first case from Italy that landed in KwaZulu-Natal was with a wife, traveled with a wife, and unfortunately a couple of days later the wife was also declared uh, infected. And uh, now in Gauteng, we, and, and what, another lady that was traveling with them on the same flight was also uh, announced in the weekend that she is in Gauteng. And then today, yesterday, I think, there were a couple also coming from Germany, age 33 and 34. We have Austria, somebody that is now in uh, Gauteng, he's age 57. Again, KwaZulu Natal, Peter Marisberg, somebody coming from Portugal and the, the Western Cape. This person was traveling. Probably was on some cruise ship, we don't know. <laughs> but yeah, he was enjoying having a nice time. And unfortunately, he came back with that virus and landed in the Western Cape. So these are the 13 cases that we are sitting with as of today, or at least here, yeah, yesterday. And uh, yeah, Monday I was called Mafikeng FM. Dog, now we have it in Mafikeng. What is this? I said, I mean, in Northwest. I said, oh, wait, what is this all about? Then when I go to check my archives, I actually come across this. Then I had to go and explain, calm down on the radio, people, let's not panic. It's still, like you see, you, you've realized it's not noted on the previous slide because it's not yet a confirmed case. So probably somebody just panicked and ran to the hospital, but then because with high fever, like I said, it's difficult to really differentiate between flu and corona. So that's the hassle we are facing. And you can imagine now the flu season coming, we'll all be flocking to the hospitals, they'll be flooded, we'll be infecting each other while running for medication. So it's gonna just get, so, so the best is not to panic, honestly. So we're still waiting to hear from NICD, National Institute for Communicable Diseases, as to what is happening with this case in the Northwest. We're obviously crossing our fingers that it doesn't come up positive. This is the NICD, they are on the ball with this testings. Uh, there's the team, the one in white, Dr. Janusz Pawelska is the leader. And there's the kind of lab they're in. It's a special pathogen unit, SP4 unit. You only get two of these in Africa, or the other one is in Egypt. But this one actually is the one that serves as the main center surveillance for the whole of the African continent. So we are equipped in South Africa to actually be able to quickly test, maintain, quarantine, contain, whatever needs to be done, the team is on board. It's actually very, it's, it's hectic. Like uh, Prof was introducing Prof Lynn Morris as one of my mentors. She's the CEO, or should I say the director now of NICD. You know, she doesn't have a minute to talk when it comes to this, because it's hectic. They, 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 they're, they're on the media every day. You know, it's, it's just, Bed. And why is this unstoppable? In China, there were reports that are suggesting that uh, uh, people are having up to six negative test results before they're even properly diagnosed, or the seventh one will then become positive, you know? So those were the kind of things that were happening uh, when it all started. And uh, the tests uh, work, how it happens, for those that are not, but I see we don't have a big crowd as such, so probably, probably most of us will understand what I'll be talking about. They work by looking for the genetic code of the virus, and then a sample will then be taken from the patient. In this case, it's a swab from the nose, the throat, and even the lungs. Patients have to even be asked to give a, 
a phlegm, cough out a phlegm for the samples to be taken for testing. And in the lab, this virus genetic code is then extracted if the virus is there in the patient and then repeatedly copied to make more quantities of it to be detectable. So it has to be like be multiplied so that it can be detectable by the test. These tests are then referred to as your reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. These are widely used in medicine and uh, for viruses such as your HIV and your influenza. And they have a very low rate of false results. So we believe we've been using this for years. We know that these are the best kind of tests we can use. So people are getting negative tests and then later they're getting positive. What could be the reasons? One explanation might be that uh, the tests are accurate because we know they should be accurate. But now at that time, the patients do not have the coronavirus uh, at the time they're testing. Reason being with viruses, there must be a limit of detection. Once you get infection, I'm infected, I'm sure you've heard about the HIV, there must be a viral load. You know, there's a load that must be there in the system, in the body, for the test to be able to pick up. So that might be one of the reasons. Again, it's still a learning curve with this new virus. It's also a cold and flu season in China. So patients might just be panicking to say, hey, I have a coronavirus, meanwhile it's not. Or maybe patients were not infected at first, and then later as they go to test and test, then they actually find that uh, the virus is then now really in the system. So it might be any of those. Another option is that the patients uh, do have the virus, but then it's like I said, it's still at an early stage, not enough virus to detect in the body. Because even if we know that the RT-PCR uh, test is supposed to work, it needs something to start on, you know? There must be some material to actually start multiplying. So if it's too low, it might not uh, be able to do the multiplication that it needs. And we've seen this with Ebola, that uh, there's about 72 hour waiting period for the virus to actually come. So you can, a patient will come, test negative, but after 72 hours, they actually find that now the, 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 the person is infected. So there's that waiting period. And again, with the coronavirus, it's still a learning curve. We're still trying to figure out as to what could be the waiting period, how long, and so forth. Uh, the good news, though, I come bearing hope, not all doom and gloom. There's a C Jin, it's a company in, uh, in Korea that launched a, 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 an approved uh, COVID assay. It's an RT, PCR based assay that they've come up about and it's approved now by the Korean CDC. So we'll see how this one goes. Hopefully they are now rolling it out to trials and to affected countries and to see whether it helps pick up this uh, negative to be positive quicker than what it used to before we got such. So we expect it to be a, a, an upgraded version of their usual RT-PCR test that we use. Another one is the development of a clinical application of the rapid IgM and IgG combined antibody test for this uh, coronavirus. And uh, this came about, you know, because there's a, 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 a challenge in detecting this virus. You know, scientists realize that, you know, why are we depending on only RT-PCR? Shouldn't we check, start to check this in the blood and then uh, for, for antibodies? So that's then they came up with this. And uh, from this study, they said the clinical detection sensitivity and specificity of the test were measured using blood samples from about 397 PCR-confirmed uh, patients with COVID and 128 negative patients. And uh, these were from eight different clinical sites. And the overall testing sensitivity, as you can see, they found it to be 88.6 and a specificity of 90. But then, you know, when you talk about diagnostics and detections, they'll tell you it must be assured. It must be reaching somewhere around the 1990s. 99, 90, you know, so this sensitivity at this stage, but now because we are sort of under pressure, you know, nobody will say, go back and work on this. We need it to be 100% and then we'll come back. There's no time. So we'll probably we'll just take this and, you know, throw it into the clinics and uh, see if it helps. 
Singapore also claiming to have come up with an antibody test. So we're looking towards those you know, coming on board and actually helping with the detection of this and then being able to keep the virus quicker. Another option is to look at convalescent plasma as a potential therapy for COVID-19. Convalescent plasma is people that were infected and have now recovered. We actually have those. I'll show a slide on those. And those, the, you know, their plasma from, plasma from their blood can actually be used to then uh, uh, create therapy for people that are. So it's, it's, it's something that uh, scientists are really looking into. So it suggests that convalescent from patients who have recovered could be used for treatment. And this is plasma. Uh, this actually was actually used to treat Ebola in the past. Your flu, the H1N1 uh, version flu. The MERS also that we talked about coming from camels. Convalescent plasma was actually used and it didn't show any uh, adverse side effects. So it's something that can be also try it this time around and see how it can help. And uh, Gilead, another hope, it's a drug maker. In, in this month, March, they actually announced that they are running a clinical trial. They've started with the first one in China. So there's, uh, they want to do two more on this drug. They call it Remdesivir. It's an experimental antiviral drug. It's already been tested, like I said, in Wuhan. And the US are actually taking it on board, taking Gilad on board to try also and, uh, on some patients, their patients that are treated in, the, in Nebraska. The drug is still an experimental, like I said, it's not yet approved to treat any disease yet. And there are no approved uh, treatments for illnesses, just for the record. Currently, corona, there's no treatment for this COVID-19. Studies of infected mice monkeys have suggested that this drug can actually fight coronavirus. Remember, it comes from animals. So when the SARS type one happened 2003, uh, those years ago, you know, uh, scientists started trying to find a vaccine against the SARS type one. And the, it, it, you know, studies happened with mice, with monkeys, all sorts, even, uh, pigs and, 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 and so forth. And they had something already, but whatever they had was not good enough to be used in humans. So now they went back to those stocks to see if they can actually go back and see what changes they can do to those stocks that they have of vaccines to be able to fight the current corona. And uh, from this, from the uh, mice and monkeys, it appeared to cause a few side effects when it was tested in patients with Ebola. This is when it was then tried in Ebola, although unfortunately it didn't really work that well against Ebola, but it was indeed tried. So it's better to try. So the myths that I've been talking about, the new virus is deliberately created, released by people to control population in China, you know, all sorts of stories. It's not true because we know viruses evolve. Hence, I had to start with those slides showing you the MERS and the SARS, where they're coming from, and now we are sitting with the COVID-19 because of the change that can happen in viruses. And occasionally, outbreaks will happen, and then, you know, moving from animals to humans, like we've seen with the SARS coronavirus and even the MERS. So this is likely how this new COVID-19 actually happened. We still uh, waiting to hear from those that are researching in it as to where it could be coming from this time. And uh, another one is that a face mask will protect you. I'm sure you've heard by now that the masks, yes, they're good. At least you are protecting yourself. And the person that is infected, if they're using it, they're helping the rest of us because then they will not be easily spreading the virus. So we have those that we call N uh, N95 masks that actually are used by the medics. This is how they look. So hence the rate of uh, death in our medics is, is that low because they're highly pro uh, protected from this virus. And uh, unfortunately the lightweight one that we can buy at DSCAM and so forth uh, can only help us 
you know, to some extent, you know, from large drops, sprays and splashes. And uh, because they don't fit tightly, you know, if you have it, you can see there might be, you know, you know, ways, uh, spaces somewhere on the sides where the virus can actually uh, fuse through. So people with the virus on their hands also, hands they say, wash your hands regularly. We have a tendency of, you know, just scratching our nose while we are sitting. But once we have such symptoms, avoid that. Hence, when you have a mask, then it's not easy to be touching and scratching your mouth and nose. People with respiratory illnesses can wear this mask. Like I said, at least when somebody's infected and they're wearing it, at least they lessen the risk of spraying. Another myth that ran around that Bill Gates actually saw this coming, you know? <laughs> And it was not true, it was just it was a coincidence, and Netflix was coming up with a series, a new uh, movie, uh, on a series episode, they called it The Next Pandemic. And they were just doing their research, and they happened to talk to uh, Bill Gates as the founder of such uh, pandemics, you know. And uh, he happened to mention that, you know, we are bound to have it for as long as we have uh, the wet markets like we find in China. And that's exactly, so for him to mention that, he, just that sentence now everyone is saying, yeah, it means he knew it. And you know, these are the guys with monies. Maybe they're the ones that are consulted to come and control the population in the world. You know, it's a whole lot that was not the case. So this is now, I'm sure you know the debunking website that no, this is not true where they actually say what is fact and what is not uh, fact, what is a myth. So that was not true, it was just a coincidence. coincidence. And uh, another question that might come, uh, antibiotics uh, help in preventing this, in treating the virus? No, because antibiotics work against bacteria. However, once you're hospitalized, viruses have a tendency of, you know, wanting them to be nicely together with other sicknesses. So then you might be succumbing with some bacterial infection at the same time in your lungs, then you'll be, then be given uh, antibiotics to treat that. But that doesn't mean that will treat uh, the corona itself. And uh, like I mentioned before, we have cases of recovered coronavirus patients that uh, found not to be infectious. This was good news. It was a report from Reuters that the, uh, the patients who were discharged from hospital uh, but later tested positive again were actually found to be not infectious. So they were hospitalized, suspected, actually tested positive that they have it, and then they recovered. And then after recovering, they actually went to test them further so that they can have a check and they found that they were not infectious. So this is one of the good news that we can look forward to and not be all doom and gloom. And this was a report by that uh, official in China that we should just continue to deepen our understanding as scientists into this and so that we can be able to improve the tracking and the management of this virus. And another question is, is there a vaccine in preventing this? Unfortunately, not yet, but good news like I said, I'm coming bearing good news. Scientists are on board. The Moderna, Moderna have actually shipped uh, uh, vials of uh, vaccines. Moderna Therapeutics is a company in Cambridge has shipped the first batch of the COVID-19 vaccine vials to the NIH. The vaccine is created, was created just 42 days after the genetic sequence of this uh, uh, SARS coronavirus was released by the Chinese research. You know, for those that are depositing into the NCBI genetic sequences, uh, if you go now and check, you'll realize that there's a, about 13 or so, last time I checked, of whole genome sequencing that have been deposited. So, you know, science is really, it's happening. No, people are not sleeping. So we should just be optimistic and and uh, yeah, look forward to the good days of this being over. So they then got the vaccine immediately after this was released. 
they decided, okay, if this is how the whole genome looks like, it means we can target this part of the gene, come up with a vaccine. Obviously, from whatever they have in stock, like I've explained, they have already had some stocks made against cats and, you know, such kind of animals. So they just needed to modify here and there and then send. So the first virus was sent to the NIH in the U.S. in Bethesda to get the vaccine ready for human testing in April. So soon we should be hearing about this. And then another team in Israel also, this one, it was interesting how they got to actually get to the vaccine. For the past four years, actually, they've been busy. It's a team in Megal, a Galilee Research Institute in Israel. Uh, they've been developing a vaccine against uh, the infectious bronchitis virus. So it's affecting the pulmonary system, which causes bronchial disease, uh, uh, affecting poultry. This is now in pigs. So this is what their research focused on for the past four years. Then they called it pure luck now, when they actually decided to choose a coronavirus model for their system to, as a proof of concept. Remember, coronavirus comes from animals, so that's how they got to choose it, because it was affecting the pulmonary. And then after sequencing that, uh, the DNA, or in this case should be RNA, of that uh, COVID-19, they found that the poultry corona has high genetic similarity to the human one, the one that is now being published on the NCBI. And it uses the same infection mechanism. So this shows that they're not that far off from actually coming with the vaccine in a short period. So this is one of the good news that we can look forward to. So at least there's, you know, vaccines coming out, there's treatment options, there's diagnosis also, your lateral flow systems, checking your IgM and your IgGs. So it's not all doom and gloom. And uh, I guess I've covered what I promised to do as an update. That's all I had for you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Any questions? You consider them alive. Once they, they hence they, they need a host. Yes, they, when it's on this, if I cough it here, it won't have any effect because the bench is dead. It needs a living host. So if I cough it to her, she'll then re needs the next host. Yeah. So they're not alive outside a, hum a system. They need a living host, whether animal or human. But I'm sure you've seen reports saying that this particular one can actually survive for a couple of weeks on surfaces. Therefore, we need to be wiping. Again, you know, from my experience, I would say, let's, let's rather, you know, let's not panic to that extent. Uh, that you'll then be scrubbing. You know, you're washing your hands, you're scrubbing your... It's, it's still early stages. It might not be true that it lasts, for, uh, the, 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 I think the report said three weeks or something like that on the surface. Viruses need a living host. Yes, there are those that actually can survive a couple of days up to a week outside, but we are not yet sure about this particular one. You know, investigations are still undergoing, going on. Yes? Just Thank two you. questions that I have. The comparison with MERS and with SARS, the time frames of these infections and the spread. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe talk a bit um, about that? Is it uncommon to see this uh, amount of spread in this space of time? And then my second question is the screening that we're currently doing is temperature screenings in the, the entry ports, but if you're asymptomatic, you get through. Um, what mm -hmm. other methods, low cost methods, except doing a decent test um, can we employ? Yeah, the first question was uh, the, d the, the time frame. Unfortunately, we don't have as, uh, uh, we, we cannot say, you, for instance, MERS, uh, the SARS, the type one, happened back in 2003, this is 17 years ago. You know, this, and now we have this new one. 
no one was really expecting it. Why didn't it come 10 years ago? Nobody knows. Why didn't it wait for another 20 years? Nobody knows. So, but like I've mentioned that because of uh, the transmission, the, suspect, the suspicion is that based on history with the SARS type one, it came from your exotic animals, you know, enjoying such. Maybe people just reverted back to doing that or oh, all along they were eating these exotic animals without the virus in them. And it so happened that unfortunately lately, whatever they were selling now in this wet market started uh, carrying those viruses. It's still, uh, investigations are still going on. So there's no really a specific time frame we can put to this. The MERS happened in 2012 from camels. It's now eight years down the line, compared to SARS that was 17 years ago. So there's no really, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's any science that is looking into that, but possibly. And the second question was, uh, yeah, you, that second question is actually very valid. Do we have anything better to do our screening? Honestly, that's all we have currently. But it's good to see that uh, scientists are on the ball, coming up with new ways of testing. The RT-PCR upgraded, your IgM, IgG testing. Usually they'll say test for IgG, which will, which will take a couple of, you know, some time before the virus can actually show up. But then with IgM, you can actually quick, uh, pick it up quicker. Hence the scientists, uh, the, that group said, let's rather have a lateral flow that will pick up both at the same time. So, but that will then mean p uh, finger pricks or, you know, needle pricks to get blood and test, which might not be, so screening at the, you know, at the ports of entry is the quickest in terms of fever, because then we can quickly uh, put those that have fever aside and those that don't, then we are free to go Yes, unfortunately, you might be, we might be leaving you to go, but then tomorrow you catch up. With exactly how it happened with our case zero from Italy. He came, he was fine. Unfortunately, three days down the line, he started feeling not so like us. So, yeah. So we, we, we're hoping that uh, those that are in uh, diagnostics are actually busy, having sleepless nights to come up with something better to screen this. So my first question is, I've heard that the virus has mutated. Um, what should we know about that? Because I can't find any information about it. So does it mean that the virus that we have now is the mutated virus, or what does it mean? Then I want to know, so everyone is stocking up um, masks, but when should we start wearing masks? Because everyone is buying it, but no one is wearing it. And the third <laughs> one is, I'm a teacher, so I want to know when do they start closing industries, when people are dying or when there are a lot of cases? Valid questions, I must say. The first one was uh, the mutation. Uh, this is actually seen on the site that I just mentioned, the NCBI, when scientists deposit the whole genome sequencing, so after getting the virus, from the patients, they can actually do a DNA sequ RNA sequencing in this case and uh, get the genome, get to know what this virus is made of from beginning to end, the whole sequence. And then based on that, they deposit it onto this website where all these new findings are deposited, new gene genes are deposited. And then once it's deposited, it's compared to what is already there in the database. So when they compared this one to the previous SARS, which we are now supposed to be calling type one, they realized those differences. Hence, they say it mutated. It was not 100% similarity in terms of uh, the genetic makeup. Hence, now it's a, they, they call it it's a mutated version of the type one. And then the second question was masks. Is a valid question. I haven't bought any masks. So those are of us that are bought, why, did, why are you not wearing it? <laughs> you know, but it's because it's, I, I'm happy that people are not panicking. If you know that no case has, has been reported yet, for instance, in the Porch campus, why panic? You know, 
and uh, we, we, we are on, you know, NICD is on the roll with this. They take updating us daily as to what's happening, where are the cases. So for those people that are in Peter Marie's back, yes, it's scary. They have to start wearing masks. But for us that are far from Peter Marie's back, Gauteng, yes, it's there. It's not that far from us, but it's only now, what, three cases? And they're contained, remember? They're not let loose to go and infect. So hence I say, it's not yet call for concern as such. And uh, why are we not closing? Uh, then everything will be closing down. Airports, this is now goes back to that part where I was talking how, how you know, it's, it's wreaking havoc economy-wise. Again, we need to be cautious. We cannot just jump and panic. For instance, the, the first case, case zero in Peter Marisbeck, the, the couple have boys, two boys. Those boys went to school after welcoming their dead home, you know? Then it was a whole big issue that now the health minister had to actually go to the school and address the school and the teachers to say, now, since we know that your kids have been in contact with their parents and the parents have been confirmed cases, just take precautions. Should any child start coughing, please don't take it lightly because we know there's cases, you know, within your school. But they didn't go and close the school, you see, because it's just a matter of being precautious. So the teachers were actually really taught as to what really to look for and uh, should they, you know, see any signs of any common, even a common cold in that case might be, you know, a, a, an issue because there's children that have been exposed. And like for us, a common cold now shouldn't call for panic because we don't have anyone coming from Italy here. Or do we? <laughs> Please, <laughs> hope not. But yeah, that's the reason why we're not closing down yet. And we, I hear your point, we, while we're looking, waiting for people to start dying in masses, that's not really the case. Uh, we're hoping not to get that far, yeah. But as you can see in Italy, unfortunately, that's, they started closing on a whole lot of things because now the numbers are creeping up daily. Any other questions? Uh, okay, then, uh, yesterday, I was listening to SAFM. <coughs> And I heard that one of the lady who was infected, who's infected with coronavirus has been discharged from hospital and she's going into self-isolation. So I want to know whether we have preventative measures to ensure that people like her going in self-isolation do not go around spreading the infection. Um, we, 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 I, I don't expect her to really be that vicious and actually say, I'm now going out and spreading this. So hopefully she won't do that. But she was released because, you know, she, she has recovered. You say she, she has recovered. Now, yeah, I, I, I haven't heard of that case yet. But uh, if, if she was released, then it means she was not uh, a case anymore. And I doubt that she'll be released. But she's going to self-isolation. Just, we have to be cautious, remember. If, if, if the test was a true positive, and now probably it's a matter of we don't have, oh, I don't know, you say it's where? Where is this? Is? In Gauteng. Whether it's an issue of uh, quarantine space, I don't know about this case. But hence even the, the case zero from Italy is, first was self quarantine in the house, remember? So those are the steps that you, even, you know, yourself, when you have flu, that's what you're supposed to be doing, a common flu, common cold. You should be staying indoors to get it calm down, and then once you feel better, then you can go out. So it's the same sort of situation, even with the coronavirus. So for the fact that she was tested positive, she must definitely quarantine. And... Um, Hopefully, they are keeping an eye on her. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that case. Sorry. How long is the quarantine time? How long is the quarantine time? Um, first, it was, it's, 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 it's suggested to be 14 days, which is two weeks. But now, with issues like 
people test positive, I mean negative today, down the line, a couple of days later, they test uh, positive, you know, the, 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 the window period is still something we need to know. So for now, there's that 14, but it looks like it might be extended to 21. I'm sure you've heard about those, that 14 might not be enough. Maybe, you know, the health ministry needs to look into extending it another week. So I guess it will be clear once the China crew, those that need to be repatriated, come back. Then it will be clear as to... But what I understand is that during the 14 days, the patient is obviously monitored daily. It's obviously monitored daily. So should there be signs of still infection by day 14, it means the patient needs to be quarantined further. So we'll get to know, you know, when these 13 cases as they are being checked as to whether 14 days is good enough or not. I would like to know, uh, in South Africa we have a large portion of the population that is HIV positive. So in an instance where the virus is no longer contained and such a person gets it, will we not expect to see a much higher fat fatality rate? No, without a doubt. Without a doubt, like I showed, if it can kill, if those with heart diseases and hypertension are already at risk, an HIV patient is worse. So unfortunately, we're looking at that high rates. Mm. I know that when mothers are HIV positive, but they take their ARVs, they can breastfeed and it's not transmitted to the mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that's the same with the coronavirus? It's something that we will need to learn. Okay. Yeah, so it's still a new virus. So we'll see. I guess once it gets to HIV infected patients, then such studies will start, you know, rolling, being rolled out as to those that are on treatment. Is it safe now to breastfeed? Will the, chill, the infant get it from the breast milk? So it's those, those new studies. Thank you for giving me an idea for my research. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> and whether, hmm. does it have any effects? Because some people say that uh, it doesn't survive on, in hot weather. Is it true? Oh, yeah. I've seen those reports that... Uh, we shouldn't panic because we have a hot weather in South Africa. The virus doesn't survive in hot weather. It needs the cold. It still is one of those uh, unfounded, you know, <laughs> comments. We have it now. It's still not cold. And uh, we, we don't want to see it, you know, escalating so that we can prove that. But, it's, you know, we cannot really be sure. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that you are now going into a winter season, so that fact will be difficult to prove quick, you know, sooner. If we were now going into summer, then, yeah, maybe we could then be able to say definitely uh, it's not surviving in, in, hot, in hot weather, but unfortunately you are now going into winter, so we won't be able to prove that. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Is that it? That's it. Colleagues, uh, maybe just to thank her very much. Thank you. thank you very much. I think we have broadened our understanding. I think we have broadened our understanding of the coronavirus. And uh, the biggest thing that you've at least um, told us not to panic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important. So now at least we can go mm -hmm. and uh, have a good sleep mm -hmm. without uh, worrying that much. Yes. But of course, we should not just be relaxed. No, we have to be cautious. Not we true. have to make sure we do the small things, the easiest things, mm -hmm. you know, like washing no, our hands. Definitely. And another thing we didn't mention, mm. shaking hands. Hey, you know, guys, we must be kicking. <laughs> Did you see? <laughs> yes, and, and, we bow <laughs> and, and elbows. And elbows <laughs> so, uh, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you no, for a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you.